Hey folks, this is Spencer Gerald from Spark Neuro. We're excited to get into today's webinar, Your Brain on Storytelling. Um, it is exactly one o'clock Eastern, and so we're just gonna wait a couple minutes to get uh, officially started. But in the meantime, um, as people are joining, and I see them joining uh, rapidly now, um, I'd love to just start by giving you just a very quick background on uh, who Spark Neuro is, what my background is, and then we'll dig into the meat of this webinar, which is really meant to be educational and really teach you new uh, tips and tricks for how to best measure uh, a powerful story. Uh, so Spark Neuro is a company that measures the effectiveness of content, especially advertising, movie trailers, pilot TV shows, and we do so instead of by using methods that are self-report, where you're answering a survey or being involved in a focus group. Instead, we're actually tapping right into the source. We're hooking people up to measure their brain activity and other neurological responses. And we're using that to generate graphs of exactly how engaged people are with your content. What is their attention level as it goes up and down? What is their emotional reactions? as they're consuming your, let's say, advertisement or movie trailer. And so we, uh, we use that data to be able to say, not just in general and not just based on self-report about what people say, but actually how are their brains responding uh, to the content? Are they paying a lot of attention or a little? Are they having strong emotions or just feeling neutral? And being able to look at that moment by moment for the best optimization, the best targeting of your audience, um, and that's really what we do every day. We're a team of nerds, scientists, um, who've spent our lives and careers on understanding the human brain and how it relates to real world interactions. And that's actually my background. Uh, uh, my name is Spencer Gerald. I'm the founder and CEO of Spark Neuro. And my background is in studying cognitive psychology and applying it to the real world. So how does emotion work? How does perception work, visual perception? How does decision making work, decision making work in the brain? And then how do we use that in order to best leverage it for real world application. Our mission is to take the greatest of academia and apply it to the actual real world so that we can have a real impact on, on brands and on people uh, based on real uh, quantitative data that comes from the most reliable source of all, the most important thing, which is uh, something that we all carry with us every day. It just happens to be sitting on top of your neck and in between your two ears, the human brain. So with that short introduction, I see that now we have a number of people who've joined and I'm going to go ahead and uh, get started. We already have um, 54 people on board and many of those are in large groups. Um, so we know that we have over 100 people watching right now and I'm excited to jump right into the meat of the content. So we're talking today about storytelling. Um, what's interesting about story storytelling is that um, you already knew that it was important, right? I'm not here to tell you that storytelling is this new important thing that you've never heard of before. Um, however, we do want to get into some of the science of it and how you better make use of it. So we're going to start by presenting one academic study that connects storytelling and memory. And we'll get into some of the interesting uh, details of what we learned from that study. And then we're going to show two more studies that actually look at brain activity in response to stories and also the alternative of stories in a few different ways. And what happens in your brain? What is, can we understand from that? And therefore, how can we use that in the real world in order to actually make the stories we tell better? And finally, we're going to end with a case study of something that happened just recently with one of our clients, a Fortune 500 company, who was trying to do their best to tell a great story and learn some very interesting things from the research that we did. Um, and, uh, and so we'll get into that, uh, that example so that we can bring it all home and show you what, how can you use this knowledge to your advantage. This should be educational and it should also be actionable. So first of all, let's go back to that first point. Um, uh, my team did a big search all over the web from all the you know, credible uh, uh, different articles and 
there was a, a ton of articles about the value of storytelling and a ton of articles saying that like human beings are hardwired to do X or human beings are hardwired to do Y. Um, for example, human beings are hardwired to listen to stories or human beings are hardwired for love. Um, but one of the issues with these, uh, with these ex examples is that they are a little bit vague and they don't get into the meat of exactly really how to do it and what's happening behind the scenes um, in somebody's brain so that we can make actually the best effective, most actionable use of this. And so what we really want to do is go beyond the surface level of, hey, storytelling is great and give you actual tools and stories and examples and studies that you can reference that really explain how storytelling is great and how you can do it in the best possible way. So we're going to start out with uh, uh, one of my favorite experiments. It's actually an old experiment. This was conducted in 1969. So we're rewinding, you know, 50 years ago. And in this uh, example, we had two different groups. And one group was the control group. Um, and they were presented with a number of words and they were asked to memorize those words. So that's the group on the left. So go ahead and memorize these words and do the best that you can at memorizing these words. And the other was the group on the right. And instead of just saying, hey, memorize these words, they said, you know what, go ahead and use these words and write a story in order to uh, utilize these words. And then afterwards, they were tested to see which, in which case the remember a list or write a story using the words, did people remember more? And what's interesting is is the results are actually a little bit counterintuitive. Now you may be thinking, well, it must be, this is, a, this is a webinar all about storytelling. It must be that the storytelling version people remembered a lot more. But in fact, um, when asked immediately after, 99% uh, of the words on average across participants were remembered in the list, the control version, and 99% of the words were remembered in the storytelling experimental version. So it was equal. What's going on here? I thought a story was more valuable. Why is it that we had 99% recall for one and 99% recall for the other? Now this is where I get very excited because science in and of itself, although it can be very boring to read for a lot of people when you're looking at just uh, you know, a standard, uh, you know, academic article, it can be hard to digest. Scientific experiments are in and of themselves stories. And with the point is really to make it exciting and digestible. So here we are, we've got two groups, storytelling side and list side and 99% memory for both. Now, that was immediately afterwards. And immediately after studying the list or writing the story, um, memory is very high because you're storing that all in short term memory which is very different than long-term memory. So in your advertisements, it's great if people can remember it right afterwards, but can they remember it later? Does it actually encode and get integrated into their memory for the long-term? And so uh, that's where the study gets really interesting. So they let some time pass by, and then they again ask the same participants, go ahead and list out all the words that you can remember. And in the control group, the list, they only remembered on average 13%, 13% of the words that they remembered 99% of before. And in the experimental group where they wrote a story out of it, on average, they remembered 93% of the words that they were meant to remember and remembered 99% of before. Now I'm gonna repeat that because this is a key element that really emphasizes uh, why this is even more important than you might realize. The list people remembered later, 13%, and the story version people remembered 93%. That is a massive difference. And because that difference is so big, we really emphasize the importance of storytelling. What else does it teach us? Well, it also teaches us 
the way that we conduct research is fundamental to the results that we get. When you ask somebody in a survey, just after having seen an ad, what they remember, what they like, etc., boom, 99% in both cases, tie. But when you give them time, which is how real life works, they're not going to go see a car ad and then go buy a car uh, five minutes later. Um, that actually changes the results drastically. So the way in which we conduct research is absolutely critical. So that's one of the key lessons of this. The other key lesson of this is how does this apply to the advertising that you're creating and a lot of the advertising that we're testing from Fortune 500 companies across the globe? Well, it turns out that despite the fact that people know that storytelling is a better method, and now I've just given you some really interesting data about how it really affects memory, many of the ads we tested um, show a very different style. We recently tested, and I won't give away the name of the client for NDA pur pur uh, purposes, but a travel ad. And in this travel ad, it was beautiful scenery, and they would show a gorgeous beach, and they would say, relaxation. And then they would show a couple playing in the water and say, fun. And then they'd show them on jet ski and they'd say, excitement. And they were trying to hit at all those emotional buttons that are what you want out of vacation. But essentially, it was a list of words. And there wasn't a cohesive and coherent story behind it. And so we see that despite this knowledge, many of the ads out there are actually using the version on the left, not the version on the right. And that is one of the reasons why people tune a lot of commercials out. So we're going to move on to another experiment, and we're going to fast forward 40 years. Now we're in 2008, and now we have new technology at our fingertips. And this technology is uh, an fMRI. And so we're actually able to look at the blood flow in the brain, what areas of the brain are being activated, and what areas are not being activated. And again, as the story goes, um, there were two versions of this uh, of, of this experiment. So there was the story version and the scrambled version. And in both versions, there were sentences that people had to read while lying in this giant MRI machine that's scanning their brain activity. And in the other version, they were still sentences that they had to read, but they were scrambled. They didn't quite fit together. So for example, in the story version, it says, as Raymond skipped down the aisle toward his desk, he glanced around the room. Whenever his glances met those of the other children, his face lit up in a friendly greeting. So as you can see, as you read through this, each sentence naturally connects in a story-like fashion with an overarching narrative from one sentence to the next. In the other example, we see sentences similarly, um, but they don't connect as well to each other. They're somewhat scrambled. So, Mrs. Birch called in a pleasant tone, Raymond, take a bath, and then you can go to bed. Raymond noticed this immediately and asked curiously, am I four feet high? Now, it, you can read it as if it goes together, but really these are scrambled sentences that don't quite make sense um, when next to each other. And so, what happened in the brain? That's where things get really interesting. So, one thing that happened in the brain is that in both cases, there were 18 distinct areas of the brain that changed, that were activated compared to baseline. And when we look at those changes, um, it's actually really uh, interesting because essentially, for the most part, the same areas of the brain were being activated, whether you were looking at the story version or the scrambled sentence version. But the way in which it was activated and how much it was activated was very different. Now, overall, and I won't get too deep into the science of it, I, I can nerd out about this all day, but I'll give you the high level. Overall, there were seven regions of the brain that were much more active in the storytelling version than in the scrambled version. There were five areas of the brain that were actually the opposite. The scrambled version was more active than the storytelling version. And then there was a set of uh, regions that were active in the storytelling version, but not active in the scrambled version. Now, just to pull out a couple examples um, so that we can understand like, what does that really mean? Like when I say that there are some regions activated for this, but not for that and vice versa for the other regions, what does that really mean? Well, let's take a look at one of those key regions of interest. And this is the dorsal, the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex. So if we look at our brain model here, the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex is an area of the brain 
that was activated for the storytelling version, but not activated in the scrambled version. Now, what does this mean? Well, first of all, we have to be careful. There are a lot of people and a lot of those articles that I mentioned earlier that say, this is the area of the brain that processes storytelling. Anytime somebody tells you, this is the area of the brain that does X, don't believe them. That's very old science, and that has changed as neuroscience has evolved. So the lesson here isn't, this is the area for storytelling. The lesson here is that this is one of the areas that storytelling is active in, but it's interacting throughout your whole brain, and the key is that there's a difference. There's a difference in how you are reading the scrambled sentences versus reading the story. Now let's understand a little bit more about, about those differences and why they may be occurring. So one of the other differences in activation was this area. So you'll see on the left that the posterior parietal cortex um, for the storytelling, it flashed a few times and then stopped flashing. And on the scrambled version, you see that area of the brain continuing to activate. It keeps on flashing on the screen there. So what's going on here? Well, when you read a story, first you have to contextualize and integrate into that story ah, here's what it's about, and then you're just following along. And you don't need to apply that extra cognitive effort to keep reorienting, reorienting yourself. Whereas in the scrambled version, where there's all the scrambled sentences that didn't fit all well together, um, you had to keep on paying extra special attention with extra cognitive energy in order to be able to reorient, like, there's this new sentence, and now there's this new sentence, and where am I, and what's happening? And so this sort of scrambling of different sentences actually has a big difference in how your brain processes. There's a lot more to this if we look at all 18 regions of the brain, but these are a couple of the areas I wanna highlight. Now, why does this matter? It matters partly because, wow, we can actually measure this stuff. We can see uh, in real time what's happening in your brain when you're reading a story. But it has to matter way, way beyond that. It has to matter in terms of how we apply it. And one of the things that we've seen, and I'll take another example, um, we did a major study uh, where we studied um, ads across the entire financial industry from the last year. So a huge benchmarking study of the financial industry. And when we looked at those different ads, we saw that many of them followed the model that I would say is akin to the scrambled version. So, uh, and I won't name the brand, but uh, it's actually a strategy that many financial institutions were using, um, was um, we're a modern bank. And then there'd be another sentence that'd be like, we believe that uh, you shouldn't have to understand all of finance on your own, we're here to help you. And then there'd be another sentence. And the point is they were trying to do the right thing, right? The brand, of course, wants to be able to give all of the reasons why their bank is the best bank. But in effect, it was a bunch of scrambled sentences and those ads did not perform well. They weren't remembered later and they had less effect on things like brand affinity and ultimate, ultimately um, purchase intention uh, lift. Uh, so we're seeing this and we're seeing that despite the importance of storytelling, we're seeing brands do it wrong. And hopefully by driving home the science of it, how it's working in your brain, we can start to see that change. Now, this is a, an MRI machine. Um, it is massive. It takes up tons of space. It takes hours to run an experiment. It costs millions and millions of dollars and actually thousands of dollars for every time you put a participant through it. So it's not practical to do this all of the time. And so now we're gonna talk about another study that used a different technique. Um, and we're gonna talk about a study that used advertising as the stimulus. And in this study, um, we, they were using EEG, electroencephalography. EEG, um, you can see an example of an EEG device here, um, is reading electrical activity being outputted by your brain. Now, why is this important? How is this different from fMRI? Now, fMRI has really high spatial resolution. In other words, you can see specific regions of the brain, including deep regions of the brain as they're activated. However, it has low temporal, res temporal resolution. In other words, it's a big delayed reaction. 
Um, it takes time for your brain to release the signals that tell your heart to pump more blood to certain areas and that blood to flow to your brain. And if you're testing a 15 second commercial, you don't get that 15 seconds of leeway in order to see the results of an MRI. You need to know in the moment. So EEG allows us to be looking at a millisecond level to understand exactly when and how uh, content is being received. And so how, what were the results of this study? Well, there were four conditions. Two of the conditions had story, two of the conditions had no story. Um, there were the conditions on the top either had one branding moment at the end, big branding moment, okay, here's what we're advertising. And the other ones had at least two branding moments interspersed perhaps throughout the ad. Now I'm not gonna get into the branding moment side of it right now because that's actually a webinar in and of itself. And it's not so simple as more is better. Sometimes less is better, sometimes more is better. There's actually a lot of nuance um, and, uh, and a lot of evidence from studies that we've run about how and when to decide what to do in the world of logo placement within advertising. But when it comes to the story element, we saw two really important things. One thing was that when you ask people what they prefer, they, they preferred the story side. And, and that should be pretty naturally obvious as well. In general, they prefer the story side in this case. Um, uh, additionally, when you look at the neurological output from their brains, being released from their brains, there was evidence that they're paying more attention and being more emotionally engaged with the storytelling element. So what's important about this? Now we've gone from 1969, we said, okay, storytelling and memory are really well connected. And we talked about examples with the list and how people are, uh, uh, using the wrong techniques in advertising sometimes. And then we zoomed forward and now we have this MRI and can see what's happening in the brain. And we showed an example about scrambled versus storytelling and what happens in the brain and how that actually affects people. And now we're saying testing ads using EEG, a lot easier to set up and a lot easier to run studies. Now, the algorithms behind this, incredibly complex, but we are running hundreds of people's a day, people a day here at Spark Neuro, and it allows us to really get really deep, meaningful insights, moment by moment, given the granularity. So I'm gonna finally end with uh, one more case study um, that helps drive home and illustrate the point. And in this case study, um, I, again, won't mention the brand. I don't wanna embarrass anyone, although this has happened a couple times. Um, we, uh, we ended up having to test um, six different ads for a single brand. And the reason we had to test six different ads for a single brand was because this was a really important campaign. It was something that they were going to spend tens of millions of dollars airing. And so they didn't have the luxury of releasing something that people wouldn't remember later, that people wouldn't pay attention to, that people wouldn't be emotionally engaged with. So, they wanted to test these ads using our methodology, and they also tested these ads using a traditional survey-based methodology that you're, many of you are familiar with, copy testing. And so uh, what happened? What were the results? Well, if you look at our neural results, we saw that there was this one ad that outperformed all of the other ones. And there was this other ad that was actually the total bottom of the list. It was just last place. And in the other case with copy testing, it was totally flip-flopped. There was this one ad that was the worst according to our neural analysis. That was the best according to copy testing. And the worst ad according to copy testing was actually the best according to the neural analysis. What's going on here? How are they to make a decision of which ad to choose? They have conflicting data right now. And so this is an opportunity to understand what are different things measuring. And so let me tell you a little bit about the contents of these ads, and then you'll start to understand what the difference was, and then I'll tell you how we concluded this in order to uh, make a decision. So first of all, it's a, it's a big organization, risk averse. They decided, well, let's just go with the copy testing results. We've been doing that for years. So let's go with the one that has the beautiful script. And so this beautiful script one, it actually was gorgeous. It was poetic, gorgeous imagery. I mean, this was an ad that you read and you're like, wow, whew, that hit home because the script was just perfectly crafted. It had all the right messages in it. 
And that's the one that won for copy testing, but performed so poorly according to people's attention levels and emotional levels as they were watching it. On the other hand, there was one that had a personal interaction, a story about a couple, and they were interacting with each other, and there was a little bit of an argument, and then it was resolved, and there was this really interesting stuff that was going on, um, and it had kind of a beginning, middle, end, and it all connected. And so that's the one that won for neural engagement. Now, no surprise, right? Because that's the one that told the story. The other one was sort of random interspersed sentences like we talked about before. But what happened, what's going on? The results were so different. Well, they were testing different things. Uh, one element is the way that copy testing tends to work, just like we saw in the first example, was, yeah, the short-term memory right after seeing it is, um, is going to be strong. And if you're just looking at the contents of the script um, and you really meant to pay attention to it and focus on it, yes, you're going to choose the one that is so poetic. And so we, um, we wanted to understand how did that differ from the neural results. And so the personal interaction commercial um, was uh, entirely different. And, uh, and so the, we went and they said, okay, we've made our decision. We're going to go with the one that, that was supported by copy testing. But please, can you come in, Spencer and team, can you come in and can you explain to us, like, why were these stark differences here and what actually happened? So we decided to do an experiment with the people in the company themselves. And so we pay, played the storytelling app, the personal interaction commercial. And we said, okay, just listen, pay attention, relax, and just consume this content. And then we said, okay, now we're gonna play the other one, the one that you're working on, the one that you're actually developing the script for, and the one that you're filming, and just go ahead and play that one. And, and so they and, they, and we did, and they all listened and they all paid attention. And then we had some time between, right? We moved to another room, we played another video, um, and then we said, okay, everybody, you saw the two ads, the ones that were so different, whether we're using our neuro testing or copy testing. Now, everyone, you have a pen and paper in front of you. Please write down all, everything you can remember about the first ad. And everyone started writing furiously. They started writing and writing and writing. And when I saw people start to put their pencils down, I said, okay, looks like everybody's written as much as they can remember. It's okay if you don't remember all of it but you've written as much as you can remember from the personal interaction storytelling version of the ad, the one that won for neuro testing. Um, let's just go around the room. How much do you think you got right in terms of being accurate to the script? And the answer was, I think we got, I think I got 80% right, 70%, this person was 90%, another 80%. And on average, they got about 80% of the script right. And then for the other one, the one that they were a beautiful script, so poetic, but not really telling a story, I said, great, everyone, you know, write it down, go through the process. Um, and what we saw was something very different. They wrote down one word and they paused. They were trying to remember the next word and they looked at each other. Somebody exclaimed an expletive and they just said, uh-oh, I think we might've made a mistake. I said, that is okay. This is a new era where we're being able to understand human perception of stories, ads, movie trailers in a new way. And so the important thing is to learn from the experience and how can we use these different methodologies in the best possible way. So we're going to actually now conclude the presentation portion of the webinar. And I think that there's probably a number of questions that come, have come in. And I'm gonna start taking some of the questions um, that people have been uh, submitting along the way to my colleagues over here, um, Ali and Simone. And uh, one of the question was, how do you define uh, a story in advertising? Um, and so how do you define a story in advertising? Well, you, uh, we, we have two ways of answering this, right? So we could define a story and say, okay, here are the elements of what makes up a story and have a very scientific explanation. And that scientific explanation might be along the lines of, well, it has to have a beginning, a middle of an end. It has to have tension that is set up and then relieved. It has to have a narrative structure that, et cetera, et cetera. And we could say, here's what a story is not. It's not a list of words or adjectives or disconnected sentences. However, 
I think that having a scientific definition sometimes can be advantageous to us, but sometimes it behooves us to actually have um, a, a, a more artistic understanding of this because the agencies and brands out there, like you know, your instincts know what a good story is. And so the key thing that, um, that we want to understand is, uh, you know, there's a mix of the art and the science and rely on the great artists, rely on the advertising agencies and the great people at the brands to really understand this, but don't just accept the status quo. Don't do just what the self-report research told you to do because that often waters down the results. And if we're watering down the, the, the creative content of the ad, that's where it doesn't become uh, a cohesive story anymore and where we lose a lot of the benefits. So again, there's two answers. One is we can make a scientific definition. I kind of gave you some of the elements of that, but the other is trust your instincts. There's an art and a science to this. Um, I have another question. Um, uh, let's see. Um, can you say more about your EEG dependent measure? Why not just delayed memory test? Oh, great. What a great question. Uh, this is from Greg Hickok. So Greg, um, we, we actually uh, do a, a series of memory tests in every study. And, uh, and it's incredibly useful. We actually do a free recall test, right? Like what do you remember just on your own without a cue? And also uh, we do a recognition test. Here's a list of a bunch of things, most of which you didn't see, some of which you did. Which ones do you remember? Like it's just another layer, layer of memory. And then we do a subconscious memory test where we're looking for how people actually uh, recollect details. And there's, that's a whole methodology in and of itself. So we do these memory tests and those are very important. However, what that does not give us is the moment by moment understanding of why. We might say, well, this ad was not very remembered. And then you say, okay, but how do I fix it? What's the actionable insight for how do I fix this ad? Um, so that it's more remembered. And now by using the EEG um, and using the other neurological sensors that are part of our overall algorithm, um, we're able to say, well, it's because you lost attention here. And although people became a little bit emotional here, they were neutral during this part. So this part didn't resonate very well. So we need to actually amp it up over here a little bit. We need to understand what was wrong here. And so we have this second by second or even millisecond by millisecond understanding of where are people paying attention? Where are they uh, emotionally responding? I also would love to answer your question about the EEG dependent measures, how it all works. Um, and, uh, and I actually think that one of the most important things that we can ever do, if you're a scientific company and somebody says, hey, how do your algorithms work? You need to have an answer. It should not be a black box. And if you ask any company similar to us, hey, how do your algorithms work? And they say, well, it's our intellectual property. We, we can't tell you. Um, I understand that, but it is actually incredibly important to also be able to explain it. So I don't have time in this webinar to explain all the details, but I can say very briefly, we're looking at um, the measures of visual perception, how your brain processes visual information according to different frequencies and amplitudes of electricity going along certain pathways. We're also looking at auditory attention. There's a difference between somebody saying wah, 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 and I'm not actually hearing it um, uh, versus I'm actually looking at the pathways that demonstrate that somebody's actually listening to and encoding. And, and we're also looking at things like distracted attention. There's areas of your brain that um, when they are activated, we know that you're distracted, you're thinking of something else, you're daydreaming, um, as opposed to the more focused areas. And so when we look at attention or emotion, there's particular elements of the algorithm that all come together and took years and years to develop thousands of lines of code in order to uh, make sense. Of it. And so we can always get into more detail on that. Um, another, question we have here. Um, does storytelling have a greater effect on attention or emotion? Ah, I actually love this question. Um, well, storytelling has an effect on both for sure. And some of this depends on the story that's being told. Ultimately, um, emotion rides stronger in this context. It's not always true. Right, there's actually situations where, where great stories provoke higher attention 
um, and, uh, and emotion is not the main impact. But most of the time, emotion is the thing that comes from following a great story because viscerally, you're attuned to it, you're empathizing with it, you actually are seeing the character development. But then what happens is when your emotion starts spiking, so we see that happening on the graph, we then start to see um, that the next thing is your attention actually goes up. So your body is basically saying like viscerally, I'm feeling emotional, and then attention starts to rise as well. So they actually start to go hand in hand. Um, let's see, David asks, in the anecdote you told with two different ads, might you have gotten different results from your very clever experience on the agency if you had asked them to recall the beautiful script ad first? Absolutely, right? So like, that wasn't even a controlled experiment. It wasn't, um, it wasn't a scientific methodology. If we were actually constructing that as a study, the way that we did it for the study itself, um, uh, we would have had a much more controlled and uh, significant result. That was for the purpose of demonstration. In the actual study itself, David 100% right. It was controlled. It was counterbalanced. It was randomized. And there were a lot of controls in place in order to get to the result we got to. In order to illustrate that to the people that needed to understand it the most, we wanted to put it to the test with them. And we didn't take the time to do it in a very controlled study. We did it as a presentation, as an anecdote, as you said, in order to just drive the point home. And so that really is a, a, a key point, And I'm glad you brought it up. There's a difference between a real scientific study and a stunt that ultimately served its purpose by driving the point home that was already illustrated in the controlled study that we had run. Excellent question. Um, have you done or seen any studies about the impact of storytelling on experiential learning, especially with adolescents? There is so much research on this. There's like endless amounts of research about storytelling in, uh, in, in learning um, across all age groups, in fact. Um, and the results are exactly what you're already predicting. Um, there was even a study that we almost presented during this webinar, but we decided, you know what, we have enough studies here. And it actually was scientists rewriting their own academic literature to be told as a story, like I tried to do for you here today. And people learned it more, they remembered it more. Um, this is true um, across age groups, across different kinds of content. Uh, educational content, advertising content, all of the above. Um, how long does a commercial have to be to tell a good story? Ah, I love this. Anonymous attendee. It's okay. You don't have to name yourself. Um, uh, so how long does a commercial have to be to tell a good story? Well, um, the answer that I'm going to give at first is going to sound a little bit complex, but then I'll break it down for you. So on average, attention is higher for 15 second commercials and then 30 second commercials and then 60 second commercials. So on average, we see higher attention results for shorter commercials. However, the best commercials that we've ever tested have tended to be 60 second commercials as opposed to 30 or 15, or these days even six second commercials. So what does that mean? The best commercials have been the longer, the longer ones, but on average, the shorter ones are performing better. So really what that means is that because people's attention spans for commercials are low, they're not trying to pay attention. They're actually, their goal is not to tune into a commercial. It's easier to capture their attention for only a short amount of time. However, when done well, and you use longer form content really well and tell a great story, it's the longer commercials that do even better. So this comes down to how good is the story? Because if the story is not good enough, keep it short because you're going to lose people. If the story is fantastic and warrants being a 60 second, then let it be long because you're going to have more capacity to tell a better story in that context. Um, however, um, we have seen numerous cases where even in short commercials, they manage to tell exceptional stories. We have examples of 30 second commercials and even some 15 where exceptional stories are being told. 
one of the ways that we use what we do is we'll look at the 60 seconds and we'll look where are the high points of attention of emotion and we'll use that knowledge in order to figure out how do you cut it down into the best 30 seconds or 15 second version of that same story. Um, ah, Jack Payne, have you done sentiment analysis on how people respond to the ads? As in, do storytelling based ads create more positive brand associations? So it's a very interesting question. Um, the, the short answer is yes. I mean, when you ask people about their preferences, as in one of the studies that I presented, there is a preference for the storytelling ads. And that preference for the ad tends to um, transfer over to preference for brand. Now, there's a lot of um, exceptions to the rule. And there's uh, a number of examples running through my head as we speak where I can say, well, there's this exception and that exception. But in general, that is true. Now, I want to make a point, though, that helps better articulate what the answer to this question really is. Um, and that is that more important than sentiment in terms of people remembering the story later, having greater affinity later uh, for the brand, and even affecting things like purchasing intent or even actual purchasing behavior, um, is actually not the sentiment, right? In other words, it's not did they feel a negative emotion or a positive emotion? And there's way too much emphasis in the industry of doing sentiment analysis, where they say like, oh, people felt really negative here and really positive here, and we don't want people to feel negative, so let's go for happy. And what ends up happening is brands make the mistake of, of an ad that, that the story goes, happy, 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 happy. And those are actually not really stories, and they're not really memorable. So what we're looking for is actually fluctuations in positive and negative emotions. We're looking for high emotional intensity. We want to see people feel fear and then relief and then joy and then anticipation. And the more that emotions are mixed, the better job the story does at resonating, being remembered and following through. Um, uh, how, can, how can you work with my company to figure out which stories are better than others? You know, I, I don't want to turn this into a sales pitch. I appreciate the, uh, the um, the question, um, uh, the answer, like, let's just get in touch later. Um, we have many testing techniques where we measure storytelling and we measure the content and we understand how, which things are engaging emotion, where, how, um, and we look at it on a very granular level so we can really make refinements and make the best data-driven decisions in the absence or without having to rely on some of the biases of group think where everyone tends to sort of rally around and say general statements. Um, do commercials need dialogue or narration to tell a good story? Oh my goodness, what a great question. Um, you know, you would think that they might, right? Because dialogue actually helps um, in many cases to tell a better story. However, and this one I actually can mention the brand by name because we have permission to do so. Um, uh, we did a, a study with FedEx recently where they told an entire story beginning to end without a single word mentioned. We did actually uh, a, a study for Budweiser. Again, this one is one that we uh, 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 can publicly talk about and we can show the example of, where it's an entire story told without a single word spoken. And these two examples, including the FedEx one, it's called Tortoise and the Hare. You can look it up. Um, it told a whole story without a word spoken and it was incredibly emotionally resonant. It had really strong emotional appeal. And the goal of that, of that uh, ad was not to sell on the benefits of FedEx. It wasn't, we're faster and more efficient. It was, we want to create some brand affinity and show people that we can make them feel good around the presence of our brand. And it sure did serve that pur purpose. Um, and so does it need dialogue and narration? It can often help, but when really artistically done, um, it can uh, do a great job even in the absence of that. Um, I know that people are probably submitting more questions. But in the interest of time, and I see some people starting to leave the webinar. Actually, no one's left yet. Holy moly. Um, maybe I'll take a couple more questions. Um, I'll take a couple more questions just because no one's left yet. And so that must be a sign that I should keep going. Um, but, uh, but I will wrap it up relatively soon, maybe take one or two more questions. Um, what is the role of music in storytelling? So we just did a massive study um, with uh, uh, major 
content producer, a major studio. Um, uh, and as you can tell, I'm avoiding naming the brand um, because I know they'd slap me on the wrist if I said it, but they know who they are and they may be listening. Um, and the entire study was to understand the role of music and storytelling. Now, one of the things that you probably already know is that part of what music does is it tells you how to feel, right? It, it, it gives you the cues of when you should actually feel a little sad, when you should feel a little happy. Everything from the chords literature, like minor chords are tend to produce more of a sad effect. Majors end up producing more of a happy effect. Tempo, all of that stuff. At the end of the day, when we look at what is going on in music, there, I mean, there's, we could, we have a multi-hundred slide deck about music and storytelling that came out as a result of this, of this example. But at the end of the day, if I have to really boil it down, it's about change. It's about making sure that the music matches. It's not just music that's chosen. Um, it's music that actually is altered and changed in its volume and its tempo, chosen specifically to fit the story as the story is being told. When music is just a backdrop, it doesn't do very much good. When music is actually crafted to be part of the story, it does an incredible job. The other key learning is that um, change is important. It's absolutely incredibly important to see that there's change in the music. If the music stays being very repetitive, same volume, no rest, that is, uh, that's one way of doing it, but it's not as effective as if you pause for a moment, like I just did there, it causes people to suddenly tune in. And so when we look at music, there's a lot of interesting strategies. You've got the percussion, drop the percussion out for a second, causes a bit of a snapback where people pay attention again. So um, there's a lot to be said about music and storytelling, but those are some of the highlight findings. Um, again, I'm tempted to wrap it up. Um, uh, although we do have 13 minutes left, if any more questions are coming in, um, uh, I see we, we just dropped one person uh, from participants, but, um, but uh, I'm happy to take just maybe one or two more questions and then we'll officially wrap it up and, uh, and move on to tell you a little bit about what's coming next. Um, so stay tuned just for a minute so we can tell you what's coming next. All right, and with that, I'm going to skip on to what's coming up next. So we're going to be continuing to do these webinars every month. Um, so you'll, if you're interested, please let us know. We'll continue to provide these webinars on a monthly basis. Um, the next uh, webinar is going to be coming in mid-January. We're also going to be doing a lot of in-person events, sometimes actually at, the, uh, at client sites, brands, agencies. Um, and we're also going to be hosting um, interactive events um, in person in some of the key cities that we've worked in, like New York and Los Angeles. So if you're interested in having an in-person uh, seminar where we get to dig into even more depth and be in person together, that's something, and we're doing the first one of those coming in mid-January as well. So uh, uh, please let us know, and, um, and, and, we, uh, and we hope to see you there. Suddenly, I just got a big slew of questions from Alex Slater. Um, Alex, I'm gonna run through your questions really fast. And then we can always jump on the phones, phone together um, if we want to uh, understand a little bit more uh, and dig in more just in the interest of time. And of course, have everyone who's tuned in, thank you so much for tuning in. For those who want to see the answers to Alex's questions, uh, stick around. If not, thank you so much. It was an absolute pleasure. Um, we really appreciate you joining us. And please let us know what you thought, any feedback. Um, should we do this again? How should we do it better? Uh, what did you like about it? What should we do the same? Please let us know. We'd love to hear from you. Okay, Alex and the other uh, set of people who are st sticking to it for this. How many participants are in a typical EEG study? Um, how many participants? Well, the minimum amount that we will do, just as a principle of our company, is 50. Um, that's the minimum amount necessary in order to have a statistically significant result. And so that is uh, key for us, is that we won't compromise the scientific validity of what we're doing. And so 50 is really the minimum. But if you told me, well, I want to understand the difference between this demographic and that men versus women, then I would say, actually, now we need at least 50 from each group. And the costs is a, another very good question. 
Um, you know, I'm tempted to say it depends because that's what all uh, companies say, but I'll try to give you a little bit more than just that. Um, it's very much uh, a function of how many locations, it's a function of how many participants, but you know, on average, um, uh, a study costs in the vicinity of $50,000. Um, it can be more or less than that, depending on the complexity of the study, what we're studying, how many stimuli, how many participants, how many groups, um, but that gives you some sense. It's, um, uh, and so, you know, we're looking at this as the kind of thing, it's, it's a lot fewer participants than a big survey that's quantitative, but a lot more participants than like a qualitative set type of study like focus groups, just because of the, ne the necessity of the science. Um, in academia, they'll do EEG studies with as little as 15 people, but that's because they're studying very specific questions. And for something like entertainment content, the, the questions are just much more general and you need bigger sample sizes to really understand, understand it. Are you working on being able to predict ad performance? Not only are we working on it, we have strong correlations that show that we have um, predicted ad performance um, and that there is strong correlations with um, uh, ad performance on numerous levels. We ran a study uh, comparing our metrics to memory. That was an easy one. We talked about that today. We compared our metrics for the Super Bowl to which ones had the most social media activity or went most viral. There was a strong correlation between which performed best on our neurometrics and which actually performed best in social media. Um, we also did this for even purchasing. And we saw uh, a very strong correlation between the strong performing ads that engage your attention, engage you emotionally, and actually converting people into purchasing later. Um, there's a lot of caveats. It is different for different industries. Um, but in fact, yes, um, it is predictive. There are other factors in the world that need to be taken into account as well in order to make the predictive model as strong as it can be. And that's a conversation for another time. Um, uh, EEG doesn't break out specific emotions, but whether there's brain activity. So it, interestingly, EEG is very interesting. So um, it's telling you what frequencies of electricity are occurring in different parts of the brain um, and, and how strong and how repetitive. And by having very complicated algorithms that took many years to develop, we're able to understand um, the extent to which you're paying attention, the extent to which you're not. We're able to understand if you're experiencing strong emotions or not. Um, it's complex in terms of how the algorithms do that. Um, and you can tell to some degree whether the emotion is positive or negative. That's called emotional valence. And emotional valence, whether it's positive or negative, is one of the key things that EEG is used for. However, my big caveat is that people um, oversimplify, well, really everything, right? So positive and negative emotions, um, it, it's a lot more complex than just that. Um, if you're feeling nostalgic, um, is that a positive emotion or a negative emotion? If you're about to go over a roller coaster and, you know, is that a positive emotion or a negative emotion? Well, nostalgia, you're a little sad, you're a little happy, you're having memories, you miss it, but you're fond of it. You're on a roller coaster, you're scared, you're excited. And so really what's even more important than the positive and negative is those complex mixes of emotions. And that's where it gets a little bit more complex than fitting it into nice, neat little buckets. Um, and, uh, and that's a really critical element. Uh, Ginger asks, how long does it take? Well, any given session can take 20 minutes or an hour or an hour and a half, depending on how, uh, uh, on how, uh, what we're studying. Um, the time to actually conduct the study itself is less than a week. Um, and then how long it takes to do the analysis or the setup is dependent on the complexity of the study. Um, Alex says, scared is the right emotion for a horror movie trailer. I would say, actually, Alex, that is true. Scared needs to be in there, um, but you can't have one emotion in the absence of others. In other words, um, every emotion is relative to each other. So if you can't make people feel calm, then you can't then make them feel optimally scared. And so these complex combinations of emotions actually are what work well together. And that complex combination is something that we don't want to gloss over because there's always, um, there's always something that is 
uh, oversimplified when people try to create these neat little buckets of positive emotion, fear versus relaxed. It's the combinations that are actually especially important. And now Alex and I are just having a fun conversation. Um, I'd love to meet you sometime, Alex. Um, fear is not so good for food. Maybe it is. Um, there are cases where we've seen, uh, I can think of a particular candy brand that used fear in the commercial and it was a phenomenally outstanding performed commercial. It was super, it was super uh, memorable and it also had a big sales lift connected to it. Um, it was a popular candy that I won't mention and, uh, and that is uh, something that you can use any emotion for really any product. It depends on the story you're telling and how engaging you can make it. With that, I am going to wrap up. I'd love to speak with any of you who are interested to learn more. Thank you so much for tuning in. We're excited for the next webinar and we hope that you get in touch with us so we can make sure that you're here next time as well. Thanks again. And with that, I'm going to end the webinar. Thank you so much.